Welcome to Elevate Your Impact, how to boost your influence as a leader through executive presence. My name is John Godoy, and I will be your instructor in this program as I share with you tools and strategies and stories that will help you become a better leader, better influencer, and better communicator by developing that hard to describe but undeniably there characteristic of true leaders, executive presence. This course is divided into five parts. We begin by answering the question, why developing an executive present is so important. Then we follow up with the three pillars of executive presence, how you act, how you speak, and how you look. Ultimately, we finish up with how to build the habits that will ensure you build a powerful executive presence. When you think of the words executive presence, what image comes into your mind? Take a moment and write down a few words that describe that image that comes to your mind. Following that, write down the name of perhaps two to three people who also come to your mind when you think about the idea, executive presence. Executive presence is a term that telegraphs to others confidence, poise, and authenticity. It tells people you are the real deal. You are someone worth listening to. It is also a combination of what you do, how other people perceive you, and what they say about you when you're not in the room, when you're not around. It is critical for success in today's modern world of work. In today's modern world of work, success is more than just having the most prestigious title. It's about being able to command respect, about being able to make a great first impression. It's about having people listen to you when you speak. And it is a skill that is critical for anyone seeking to advance in their career. It is often that missing ingredient that people struggle with, but once they achieve it, once they develop it, can make the difference between struggling in obscurity and then leading the room. I have to be clear, it's not about having the most friends. This is not a popularity concept. It's not about popularity. It's about having a deep sense of understanding of who you are, developing the skills that you know you need to influence others, and then being able to use both of those things as a fundamental foundational tool in your leadership toolkit. No matter what role you play within your organization, whether you're the CEO, the director, or just starting off in your career, the tools that I'm going to be sharing with you today are going to help you build the three fundamentally crucial component pillars or foundations of executive presence. And that is how you act, how you speak, and how you look. The goal of this program is to increase your reputation and your influence through developing the foundational principles of executive presence. Making an impression isn't a choice, it's an inevitability. Therefore, now I'm going to share with you eight fundamental reasons why it behooves you, why it's in your best interest to start developing and working on your executive presence today. Number one, life is a pitch. As psychologist and author Daniel Pink says in his book, To Sell is Human, all of us are involved in what amounts to be non-sales selling. In other words, we're all trying to influence other people, convince other people to buy into something that we're offering. Maybe it's an idea, maybe it's an action we want people to take. And in exchange for that, people are giving us their attention, their effort, and their time. And so developing executive presence enables us to better sell our ideas, to become better communicators, to increase our influence on others. Number two. It reduces toxic work culture by creating better leaders. One of the major reasons why people leave organizations are unsatisfied or dissatisfied with their organization is because of poor leaders and poor leadership. Developing your executive presence and developing the executive presence of your senior leadership within your organization, and even just the general leadership over your organization, will ensure that they are better at their jobs they are better leaders and that will in turn enhance the culture and the retention of the people within your organization. Number three, the role of management is changing within organizations. 
We are no longer looking for managers just to be overseers, essentially command and control. Their role is moving to one of being a performance coach. And a performance coach is someone who really needs to motivate other people to, to do things, to develop, to push themselves, to grow. And in order to do that, having influence over others is so important. An executive presence is a powerful tool in that influence toolkit. Number six, it creates future opportunities. By developing the reputation as someone who can get in front of a room or walk into a room and command an audience or make people listen or make people want to listen to what you have to say is a powerful tool to ensure that future opportunities arrive at your doorstep. Number seven, it provides you with a sustained competitive advantage over your peers over time. And lastly, number eight, fundamentally, it will make you a better leader. Have you ever met someone for the first time and thought, wow, that, there's something about that individual that's just really impressive, that makes me want to know them more, learn more about them, to speak with them? Or perhaps you've, you've seen somebody over time and thought, wow, you know, that's somebody whose behaviors or habits or just style or demeanor I would like to emulate. I would like to be like that person. Or that person really commands my respect. These two scenarios essentially reflect the two situations where executive presence is so important. The first is in a first impression. Executive presence is how you come across when you first meet somebody whether they go, wow, that person's worth listening to, or perhaps that person's really not that impressive or they don't inspire me to perhaps want to connect with them more. In fact, there's research conducted by Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital that found that other people make a judgment on your warmth and competence within a quarter of a second from meeting you. That's powerful. What impression do you leave with people when you meet with them the first time? The second area where executive presence is so important is when you observe some, or when you are being observed over time, right? When you're being observed over time, people are looking at your actions, how you interact with people, how you deal with stress, how decisive you are, how you communicate, how you appear over time. And they, they develop an impression of you based on that and their interactions with you are then influenced from that perception of you. And that is why developing executive presence is so important. You use it as a first impression as well as over time. Another important thing to consider is the fact that we are now living in the hybrid world of work where first impressions can also take place not only in face-to-face -face situation but online as well. And so when you meet someone for the first time digitally online in a Zoom call and a Teams call how do you come across? Are you sending the message of leadership, competence, warmth, someone who's worth listening to? I challenge you to start thinking about what type of a first impression you make with people and is that impression one that makes people perceive, wow, this person is a leader, this person is worth listening to. At the beginning of the program, I asked you the question, what is executive presence? What image comes into mind? What are some words that help you define or explain what executive presence is? Because for many people, they can sense what it is, but they don't necessarily know the words that describe it. Well, fundamentally, or foundationally moreover, executive presence can come down to three general things. It's a combination of how you act, how you speak, and how you look. And the good news is there is research that essentially breaks down those three major foundational categories into 10 specific traits or character traits that other people look at that contribute to another person's executive presence. Here they are. Status and reputation, physical appearance, projected confidence, communication ability, engagement skills, interpersonal integrity, values in action, intellect and expertise, outcome delivery ability, coercive power use. 
The research was conducted by Dagley and Gaskin and published in the Consulting Psychology Journal. And the research title was Understanding Executive Presence, Perspectives of Business Professionals. A fun activity that you can now do, given the fact that you now know what the 10 core characteristics of executive presence are, or at least research-backed characteristics, is to score yourself on a scale of one to 10 on each one of those 10 categories. And that aggregate score will essentially be your executive presence score. And over time, perhaps again in another six months, once you practice some of the skills and the tools that we're gonna share with you today, rescore yourself. And then you can essentially measure your increase in executive presence. There are three influential and important factors that influence an individual's ability to develop their executive presence. The first issue is diversity. And gone are the days where we had this Hollywood image of what someone with executive presence was. It was perhaps a, a person from, from a movie wearing a business suit, a power outfit, perhaps silver or gray hair, looking like they command uh, an organization, the CEO of an organization. Those days are gone because we have a diverse group of people in the world of work today. And so executive presence is different for many people. The second factor is self-confidence. Some people have it in droves and some people are still working on, on building it. And executive presence is one of those skills that builds confidence. And the third factor is the battle between authenticity and conformity. Uh, oftentimes an organization has an established culture, uh, an established expectation of what leadership is, what uh, an executive or what a leader within an organization should come across, how they should come across, how they should speak, how they should be. And then someone within that organization or coming into that organization who may not necessarily adhere to those exact standards may have an internal battle of whether they want to essentially change components of themselves or, or give up comp aspects of themselves in order to fit in or do the opposite completely rebel and completely be themselves and force the organization to change. And that can cause a significant battle. Fortunately, there is research that supports the idea that as an individual progresses in their career and they move up further and further within an organization, their ability to be more of themselves, more authentic to themselves, bring more authentic aspects of themselves to the workplace increases. And thereby, once they get to those higher levels of the organization, their impact can be greater because in many respects, they're being able to be more of themselves within an organization. The challenge to you, as you develop and you work on your executive presence, is to find that right balance between being 100% authentically yourself, being the person that you want to bring to the workplace, and at the same time, meeting the standards and ex the expectations of the established culture within the organization or the industry within which you find yourself. Good news, executive presence can be developed. It is a set of skills and attributes and characteristics. If you don't necessarily have it or you want to elevate, you can take actions, apply certain skills, train yourself to develop those skills and those characteristics so your executive presence, your ability to influence, increases. An important issue to address here is the distinction between charisma and executive presence. Now, both are learned social skills. However, the difference between executive presence and charisma is that charisma is more something that comes more naturally to certain people. It can be something that uh, perhaps they've had more experiences, more opportunities to be a little bit more social or develop experiences that get them to be a little bit more open to others, more charismatic, so to speak. Whereas executive presence are really more skills that you can learn to influence perception that may not necessarily have come naturally, but if you put much more effort into it now, you can develop it and then ultimately come across as being perhaps more charismatic. That said, let's get going with the first pillar of executive presence, how you act.
The pillar of how you act can be summed up in three general ideas. It is a combination of your ability to do your job well, your professional knowledge, and your professional reputation. In sum, be good at what you do, develop a strong foundational knowledge of what you do, of your expertise, and develop a strong image and reputation of being good at what you do and being able to communicate what you do to others. One way of identifying your competency or being much clearer on what you are really truly good at, where you can truly shine and develop a powerful reputation around, is to identify what your circle of competence is. And the circle of competence is attributed to, or the idea, the mental model of circle of competence is attributed to Warren Buffett's business partner, Charlie Munger. And essentially what a circle of competence is, is I want you to imagine that there are two circles, one small one inside of a larger one. And inside that small circle, this is your circle of competence. You write down the, the field of study you, are, you studied or perhaps uh, the type of work that you do or the type of knowledge that you've spent a lot of time studying and perhaps things, topics that are of interest to you, things that you find yourself reading more about, perhaps in a professional setting. Okay? You put that in the small circle. And then the larger circle, well, that, that's where you put things that perhaps you're not that interested in, you, you're, you are okay at, but you're not an expert at. And the idea behind a circle of competence is that we can only truly shine if we stay focused truly in the areas of, 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 or topics within that smaller circle. The further we leave that circle and we move more towards what is called our circle of incompetence, what we're not good at. And when we start spending a lot of time in our area of incompetence, well, <laughs> our reputation, how we're perceived can seriously take a hit. And the other thing is we're never going to really truly excel at it. So one way of identifying your competence is to identify your circle of competence and one of those activities are in your workbook. Another way to shore up your executive presence is to identify what your values are. Because as a leader, knowing what your values are, well those values serve as a compass for all your decisions, right? And you identify those values and you ensure that all your actions essentially align with those values. and what will happen is that all your actions moving forward will become consistent, right? And perhaps these values are gonna be leadership-based values about, let's say, integrity or timeliness or honesty, whatever they might be. And as long as you make your decisions in line with those values, you will create a consistency of action. And that consistency of action and behavior will be seen by other people and that'll influence their perception of you. And the stronger and the more powerful those, those values are, and the more consistently you adhere to them, the more people will see you as someone who truly follows their convictions, truly follows their values, and that, by default, is a form of executive presence. It enhances your image in the eyes of others. Now it's time for an exercise. Take out a piece of paper or in your workbook and just write down four or five different leadership values that you truly feel you are connected with and represent who you are. As more work shifts from traditional command and control structures to more collaborative work environments where we collaborate with other departments and other teams and other people throughout the organization or outside the organization, how leadership is done is dramatically changing. New skills are needed and one of those skills is the ability to read other people well. is essentially to read a room, understand what other people's motivations are, and understand how to perhaps be able to influence them. In many respects, it is the ability to get work done through other people, to inspire, influence, motivate others. And that is essentially emotional intelligence. It is the ability to know when to be decisive, when to show your teeth, and when to perhaps step back. It's the ability to modify your communication style and how you get your message out depending on the audience, whether it's one person or many, that you're addressing. It's to sense the appropriate time and the appropriate place for your decisions and your actions. It requires the knowledge and the understanding that not everybody has the same motivations. Others that you are leading, that you are communicating with, that you are trying to get work done through, 
well, they may not have the same perspective and the same values and the same interests and motivations as you do. So it's so important to develop your emotional intelligence to be able to really try to understand others. And that will help you ultimately communicate with them, connect with them, and lead. An example of this is if you find yourself running a meeting and then you walk into a meeting and then you see that perhaps the, the members within your organization, the members in that meeting may not all be super excited to be there. They may be fatigued, their mind may be elsewhere, the mood may be low. So your ability to be able to read that room and sense perhaps I have to change how I was going to communicate with them. Maybe the thing that I was going to talk to them about may not be appropriate during this meeting. I'll send it at another time or I'll address it at another time. That in some respects is emotional intelligence. The ability to sense mm, perhaps this is not the perfect time to, to give this piece of information and maybe I should do it at another time. A powerful way to develop your emotional intelligence is to embrace the mindset that every individual that you deal with, that you lead, that you come across has different self-interests than you, different motivators. And taking a step back and thinking, okay, what is it that motivates them? What is it that they want? What is important to them? Taking a small moment to think about that and then adjusting or modifying uh, what you're about to say or the decision you're about to take based on what you perceive the other person's interest might be, a small modification can perhaps dramatically change the results that you receive. Developing the reputation as being someone that can be counted on when the chips are down, when things aren't going well, is fundamentally the most important component of being perceived as a leader. That demonstrates that you have the skill and the ability to manage tough situations, make decisive decisions, and you don't crumble under pressure. Here are four ways to develop and forge that skill. Number one, focus on developing what's called grace under pressure. The ability to come across as being calm and relaxed, or at least under control during times of stress and uncertainty, because most people hate un uncertainty. And what they do is they look to leaders who inspire calm and re inspire resolve during those challenging times. Number two, be a decision maker. A lot of people hate making decisions. They, they hem and they haw at making tough decisions. Practice being very, very decisive in your day-to-day -day actions. Number three, connect, then lead. And this goes back to the idea of warmth and competence. Exhibit warmth by connecting with the individuals that you're leading and then exhibit competence by leading them. Be decisive, tell them what you need to get done. Number four, develop confidence. And you develop confidence by exposing yourself to stressors. A powerful way that you can ensure that you come across with very strong and positive executive presence, that you come across as a leader worth following, a leader with strong emotional intelligence, is to focus on being a leader who exhibits both warmth and competence. Social psychologist Amy Cuddy found that 80% of an individual's perception of another stems from two things, the degree to which they are warm and the degree to which they are competent. If you look in the workbook, there is a diagram, a four quadrant diagram that illustrates the warmth competence connection. The more you are to the top right hand side in a balance between competence and warmth, people will admire you more. They'll see you as being somebody to favor, someone who is a leader worth favoring. The more you move towards, let's say, the opposite, which is cold and, let's say, incompetent, well, people will see you as being someone who they are in contempt of and they will generally reject what you have to offer. So always seek to be warm and competent. Here are seven characteristics to exhibit warmth. Nod, a smile, an open gesture, listen, give them a greeting, project positive nonverbal signs, and make eye contact. You are always 
on. If you really think about it, you communicate virtually everywhere, whether it's a chance encounter in a hallway or by an elevator, or perhaps it's a Zoom call, Zoom presentation. Maybe it's a formal presentation. Maybe you're conducting a meeting. And others are always making snap judgments of you based on how you come across. They judge your competency. They judge your ability to be a leader. They judge your ability to influence others based on how you communicate. That's why this section, we're going to be teaching you some fundamentally powerful tools to enhance your ability to influence others by how you communicate. Do you speak clearly and confidently? Are you articulate? Are you able to speak in a way that you're able to keep things short, simple, and concise? Are you able to persuade others through your words? These are important questions to ask yourself, because if you can't, then chances are it's going to be very difficult for you to lead others and ensure others do work that you need them to do or get the messages that you want others to get from what you say. When it comes to influencing others and persuading them, the key is not so much the content of what you deliver, but how you get that message across. A recent study of 120 financial professionals found that the larger part of their message, their ability to persuade other people, did not come from the actual content, and they found that only 12% of their effectiveness came from the content, but rather from their passion, 27%, the voice control, 23%, and their overall presence, which was about 15%. So you can see the how that we get the message across can be much more important than the content, the what we try to get across. And that is why developing our speaking skills, our public speaking skills is a fundamentally crucial component of enhancing our ability to lead others through communicating. In that same study, researchers found that a spokesperson's demeanor, appearance, and tone was nine times more impactful than the content of material that they provided to the listener, to the investors, than was just the content that they tried to present. That's powerful. As a leader within your organization, or as a professional who's moving further and further ahead in their organization, taking on more responsibility, taking on more leadership roles, you will find that a lot more of your work will involve giving formal presentations, communicating in a much more formal, organized structure, like a presentation. And the thing is, the people that you're presenting to, well, they'll take or they'll make judgment calls of you, of your capacity, of your competency, of your leadership ability, based on how well you give those presentations, how well you communicate in those types of situations. Here are eight ways to speak and sound like a leader that will enhance your ability to come across as a professional when giving presentations. Number one, think about what you say and how and when you say it. Number two, know what you think, know what you think. Oftentimes people don't think about what they're about to say or they're not too sure about what they're talking about and then they speak and that can make you lose a bit of credibility as a leader. Number three, develop your linguistic style. Make sure you come up with your own cadence Make sure you think about the tone in which you speak. Start using pauses. Use your voice as a tool to control volume and impact and emotion. Number four, be succinct. Be succinct. That means keep your messaging and your words and your sentences and your thoughts short, simple, and concise. People's attention spans are only so much, only so big. If you keep talking and talking and talking, they're gonna cut you out and eventually they'll no longer be listening to what you're saying. Number five, become a storyteller and a story collector. Anecdotes are a powerful tool to get your message across. That's what we as humans have been doing since history. Throughout the course of history, we pass down information from generation to generation, from person to person using stories. Stories are a powerful vessel to, to essentially serve as the glue that enables facts and more detailed information to connect into the mind of who you're speaking with. Number six, put yourself into the shoes of your audience. This is kind of like a needs analysis or really think about it from their perspective. Uh, one simple way to think about this is, 
is what you're saying something of interest to the audience? Because if it's not of interest to them, then chances are they're not, probably not going to listen to you fully. Number seven, be aware of the curse of the expert. And this is one that basically focuses around the concept of a data dump. A data dump is when people who know a lot of information about a given topic, they just dump more and more and more information, thinking more information uh, is important and it makes them look more credible and it's, it helps the learner uh, retain more. And usually it's not the case, especially in a formal presentation. A data dump can be a negative thing. Number eight, practice radical candor. Be direct in what you say, be honest, but again, remember to combine it with warmth. When it comes to developing public speaking skills, another important thing to think about is developing the use or incorporating the use of body language. And oftentimes we don't really think about how powerful the language that our body speaks is, but a great way to realize or to think about this is imagine having a telephone call with somebody and trying to have a conversation back and forth or tell a story versus having a video call with that person or being in face-to-face -face person with that individual and having a conversation while telling the same story. Very big difference because we are so visual, humans are very, very visual, so much of the message that we receive and we're able to give comes through our body language and we just use voice it's not as powerful. And that is why it's so critical to start thinking about ways to develop your body language and also how to incorporate it more. And so here are four strategies to help you incorporate more body language, or at least to help you use your body more in effectively getting your message across. Number one, get rid of as many physical barriers that are between you and the person that you're speaking to or this people that you're speaking to uh, one way to think about it is imagine that you're standing in front of a group and you have a lectern that's a barrier people can't see your body get rid of it so you can approach number two look them in the eye whether in person or on online that creates one more level of connection the lack of eye contact can be a barrier to creating warmth and rapport and connection number three Keep an open stance versus a closed standoffish stance. That open stance will help you better connect with other people because it'll create a sense of warmth and enable you to come across as being someone who's much more open and much more collaborative and much more, I guess, warm uh, in your connection with someone else. Number four, make movements meaningful. One obstruction that can occur in presenting and speaking and public speaking is doing all sorts of gestures and moving your body uncontrolled which can be very distracting and be detrimental right? however if you start making your movements much more thoughtful and purposeful you'll be better able to get your message across to the other person interpersonal communication skills are one of the most important and critical workplace skills to develop for anyone in a leadership type position. The challenge is that interpersonal communication or just communication in general is not, a, is not as easy as one might assume that it is. In fact, it's a very complicated process. And in the workplace, miscommunication happens a lot. And oftentimes it happens because people just don't fundamentally have the skills to do it or they don't fundamentally understand how it works. Oftentimes when people think about interpersonal communication, it really just comes to them from the perspective of one person communicating an idea to somebody else and then the other person communicating an idea back and it just go back and forth like a game of ping pong. However, it is not. Communication, especially interpersonal, is much more complicated. Let's start with what we call the traditional communication model to give you an idea of what it is and how complicated it is. So I want you to imagine that at the very beginning, one individual has an image in their head and, the, and that image represents an idea, uh, a message that they want to get across, but it's in the form of an image. They then have to turn that image into words and those words are influenced by the person's education, their experience, their interpretation of those words, their position uh, in, within an organization, their interests, uh, their psychological biases, cognitive biases, all those factors. And then they turn it into words and then they have to put it into some sort of a medium, whether it's a text, 
a verbal message, a presentation, an email, a phone call, a video call. And then they have to, they basically put it into that medium, they transfer it to the other person, the person receives it, has to essentially decode that message using their own experience, their own biases, their own interests, and then hopefully they have the same image in their mind that the sender had originally sent. And then once they decode that image, they create their own image in response and it goes back. So it goes back and forth, back and forth. And so you can see how challenging just communication in general can be. And if you've ever played the game telephone, perhaps as a child, well, one person has a word, they whispered it, or a sentence moreover, they whisper it into the ear of somebody else and no one else could hear. They pass it on to the next person and the next person. Eventually, the message gets completely lost. And that happens in everyday communication at work. Here are seven strategies to improve your interpersonal communication skills. Become a better listener. Number two, understand learning styles, different people's learning styles. Everyone has a different preference, whether it's uh, audio, visual, or kinesthetic. Understand communication styles. Are they direct or they prefer to beat around the bush or tell stories more, or they like to incorporate pleasant pleasantries more? Different people have different communication styles. Number four, find your strategic executive voice and style. Identify how you communicate best. Number five, stick with facts and avoid as much as you can to incorporate too much emotion into your interpersonal communication. Number six, develop the ability to connect with different types of people through many different types of communication platforms and technologies. Number seven, always keep in mind, try to help other people become a better version of themselves. Have you ever tried to get your message across and you found that the other person just cannot seem to understand what you're trying to say? You just cannot seem to find any common ground, you can't seem to connect? That can be a result of the fact that people have different frames of reference, different perspectives. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when you want to become a better communicator. You want to develop your ability to connect better with other people. The following are five potential barriers to communication that involve frame of reference. Number one, cultural barriers. These are differences in language, nonverbal behavior, customs and values that may exist between people from different backgrounds. Number two, physical barriers. These are environmental factors that can affect how people communicate. Number three, psychological barriers. These are personal factors that can affect how we communicate and connect with others. For example, anger or depression can interfere with the quality of our communication to others. Number four, semantic barriers. These are problems that occur due to the multiple meanings of words or differences in the meaning of words between people from different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Number five, perceptual barriers. Perceptual barriers occur when we have an inaccurate perception of others that interfere with our ability to communicate with them effectively. So this begets the question, what do you do? Well, here are four things that you can do to help deal with framing, to better connect with others, keeping in mind other people's frames of reference. Number one, do a little bit of research on the people that work for you or that you're trying to connect with. Try to find out a little bit about their background. Number two, be choosy on the words you choose to use. Number three, take a little bit of time and do a little bit of research in terms of anecdotes, metaphors, and stories that are much more likely to connect with others based on their own personal frame of reference. Number four, find out their self-interests, find out their motivators. If you can tailor your messages or what you're trying to say to take into account the self-interest and the motivators of your audience, you're much more likely to keep their attention and connect with them. One of the most powerful tools in a master communicator's toolkit is the ability and the skill of asking questions and listening. Oftentimes when we think about a, a person who's a great speaker or a great communicator, we think, who can talk the best? Who can tell the best stories? But as an individual progresses in an organization and takes on more and more leadership billets and responsibilities, what one comes to realize is that perhaps not speaking so much and giving out information is the important thing, but rather 
bringing you in in. Because the more information you get, the better decisions that you can make, the better that you can do at your work. And two powerful skills to do this, to develop this ability to bring in information, is to ask questions and listen more. Here are three benefits of asking more questions and being a better listener. Number one, you show people that you care. People love talking and people love being heard. It makes them feel good inside. And so the more questions you ask, the more you listen, the better rapport you will have to other, with other people. And that will help place you and be see, help you be seen as someone who is a tremendous leader, someone who cares about their people. And that'll go a long way in developing your executive presence. Number two, you eliminate a lot of the filter bubbles that may exist in your head and amongst your small group of leadership colleagues. Oftentimes people in leadership billets surround themselves with like-minded people uh, and what that can do is they can lead to what amounts to being an echo chamber and a filter bubble in many respects. So what being a good listener and good question asker is, does or allows, it enables you to get different information, different types of information that will in, in essence enhance your ability to understand and make better decisions. Number three, we just simply get more useful information and that information truly enables us to do our jobs better versus just spitting out, spouting out information to other people. We can definitely get more that helps us do our work better. My challenge to you is the next opportunity you get, the next meeting you conduct, or the next conversation with you have with someone, instead of thinking about speaking more, I would challenge you to reverse your role. Just think solely about asking questions, listening, and getting in good information. You'll be surprised at how how great of a communicator you'll be perceived as being. At a recent communication skills workshop that I conducted for a large biotechnology company based out of California, I asked the group of executives what is or what are their biggest pet peeves or annoyances when it comes to listening to presentations because that's what they do so much of their time. They have to listen to dozens and dozens of presentations every month, whether it's in meetings, formal presentations, or sales presentations. So I asked them, what are their biggest pet peeves? And the list was huge. They said things like people spoke in a monotone voice, people did data dumps, just giving more and more information, just dumping data on people that was too much to process. They said that the, the speakers or the presenters had no energy, they weren't engaging, and they, or they went off on tangents. There was just a myriad of different reasons that just drove, uh, drove them crazy and made them check out, stop listening to the presentation. Now what I would like for you to do is just take a couple moments and perhaps jot down or think about what are the characteristics of a great presentation that kept you engaged, that kept you interested, that kept your attention. Fundamentally the most important thing, your attention. Being an exceptional presenter is a fundamentally crucial component of executive presence because what it does is it shows people that you have the ability to communicate your ideas well, you are able to consolidate your ideas into a clear structured format that people can then process easily, understand and follow, and then you have the ability to persuade others, keep them engaged, keep their attention. And the good news is, that it is a learned skill. And now I'm gonna share with you a series of skills that you can develop and apply that will make you a phenomenal presenter and thereby increase your executive presence. Conduct a needs analysis on your audience. Find out who they are. Establish rapport with your audience at the very beginning. Perhaps a couple minutes of general conversation, just some banter is a great way to break the ice. Start strong. Define your main topic or big idea right from the beginning. Keep your presentation to two to three main points. Make eye contact, whether in person or online, with the people that you're connecting with. Stay on topic. Engage the audience's senses. Keep your audience engaged. Interact with them. Use stories and anecdotes. Finish on time. Definitely, this is a big one. Finish on time. Give a call to action at the end. Tell them what you want them to do. Anticipate resistance. Lose the jargon. Determine the right length of your presentation in advance. Conceptualize and simplify your displayed information. In other words, use visually appealing PowerPoint. Make sure that you're well rehearsed. Use your body to communicate. 
Use your voice as a tool to communicate. Root your presentation in evidence. Up until this point, we've covered how you act as a professional, how you act as a leader. In other words, your professional actions, your professional habits that make it appear or create the perception of competence and credibility as a leader. We've also covered how you communicate, your ability to effectively articulate your message to others. Now we're gonna be covering the third section, how you appear, how you look, literally how you look as a leader. Because what this does is it creates the perception of strength, of leadership, of credibility, of competence. Because human beings are highly visual people and therefore how you look does play a significant role. And I'm not saying it's about how beautiful you look or how good looking you are. It's just about how effective you are at creating a perception or an image of competence of trust, of leadership. A powerful way that you can create a, the perception of leadership, how to stand out from the competition, how to look like a professional in a field of amateurs, is simply by how you dress. There was a study conducted by a gentleman by the name of Joe Navarro of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. And he talks about an internal study where they took two groups of agents and what they wanted to do is to see if the type of clothing that they wore influenced their behavior, influenced their behavior. And what they did is they created a scenario, it was a hostage rescue scenario. And one group of agents, they had dressed up in traditional business attire, what you see on television as a, <laughs> many times as an office business suit, what you see FBI agents wearing in a lot of the television series. And then the other group, they had them dress up in military SWAT gear, and tactical outfit. And they were, both groups of agents were given the same scenario, create a plan to rescue the hostage. Now the group that was dressed up in the business suits, well what they did, decided to do is create a command center, opened up a line of communication, and tried to negotiate the release of the hostage. And the group that was wearing the tactical gear, well, their plan was to essentially reach out to the hostage taker and then break the door down to rescue the hostage. Two different plans, and a lot of it, they found, was determined. A lot of the, the, the difference in approach was influenced by what they were wearing. And so that's one aspect of the importance of being aware of what you wear, because it influences how you carry yourself. On the other side of the coin, it influences other people's perceptions of you, right? The more powerful, the more quality, the more well put together you look, you appear to the visual eye, the more respect, the more of an impression of authority you can give others simply through your attire. So don't leave it to chance, dress strategically. And you can do this by essentially what we call building your armor, building your professional armor. And what this essentially is, is a uniform, very similar to what a police officer perhaps wears or a soldier wears or a doctor, a doctor or a nurse wears into their workplace. They put on the clothing, it influences how they feel, but it also influences how other people interact with them. You build your own armor, your own uniform, by selectively choosing a specific wardrobe that makes you feel powerful, that you feel projects authority, project leadership, and wear it just like a body, uh, just like a, a piece of armor. And it will enhance your ability to influence others. Now the choice of colors you choose to wear plays an important part in the message that your clothing puts out to others. And that in, term, in turn affects how they perceive you and their judgment of you. And so if you go to the workbook under the section on the effects of color, you'll find out you'll, there's gonna be a listing of different colors and essentially the subconscious or oftentimes conscious messaging that those colors influence in others. So depending on whatever role you have, whatever type of company you have, or whatever type of message you want your clothing and the color of the clothing to relay to others, use this list to help you determine what color is good for your armor and what colors you may want to use in different situations to relay or create different messages. I have a task for you. If you find yourself a little bit fashion challenged, if you don't truly understand how to use 
clothing and color as a tool to influence others, pick out a friend of yours who that you trust and who, know, who you know will help you, and then ask them to give you feedback on how your appearance, your in terms of clothing, how you come across, what message they feel that you give, and then ask them for their help and their feedback in designing your own suit of armor, your own uniform that helps you project the image of leadership, authority, and authenticity. Remember that people are always observing your behavior, whether that you realize it or not. Therefore, always be aware of your physicality. What message your physical presence, your physical bearing is sending to others. Here are five ways to look and come across with more authority, power, and presence. Be expansive. Take up more physical space. Stand with good posture. Walk with confidence. Display physical gestures of openness. Eliminate body language detractors like fidgeting. Leadership is demanding. Therefore, it is important, it is critical to create an air or create the appearance or the perception of strength, of resiliency, that you can handle the rigors of making tough decisions, of weathering the storms, of uncertainty, of being the person that people can turn to in times of trouble and challenge. And you'll have the strength and capacity to navigate those times. Well, in other words, you're not going to keel over. Exuding health, energy, vitality, resilience, that's not something that can easily be faked. It's important that you develop the energy, the vitality in the first place. And there are six things that you can do very easily that it behooves you to incorporate into your day-to-day -day activity that will give you the strength, that will give you the energy to come across as a leader. They are the following. Number one, do your best to get seven to eight hours of sleep every night. Number two, eliminate the stressors in your life, whether they are activities, they're people, whatever they might be, eliminate the stressors in your life so they don't drain the energy that you have, the limited amount of energy that you have. Rest more, take more vacations. You can't just keep pushing through and hope to expect you're gonna have plenty of energy. Take more rest where you can get it. Drink more water, stay hydrated. When the body isn't properly hydrated, it doesn't function effectively and people can see that fatigue. Eat healthy. Energy comes from food. Therefore, it behooves you to put good food into your body. Exercise regularly. This will make you stronger, makes your muscles stronger, makes your heart stronger, so that you have the physical capacity, literally the physical capacity, to endure the challenges of work and leadership. There is a quote that says, first we shape our environments and then our environments shape us. In the last section, I shared with you strategies on how to have more energy, simply based on your habits. But for many professionals, finding time to do those habits can be a challenge. Perhaps there's not even a desire to do those habits. If you find yourself in that group, then I challenge you, or I, I wanna share with you this other philosophy or other way of approaching how to get more energy. And that comes from reshaping your environment to facilitate or to support health and well-being. There was a study done by a gentleman by the name of Brian Wansink. He was from Cornell University and the study was done at West Point and the study focused on how to get the cadets at West Point to drink more water. And as it stood, how cadets at West Point at lunch were to get wa uh, generally got water was they would have to get up from their, their eating tables, walk to the side of the room, and then refill their glass full of water and then walk back. That required effort. That would require a habit of every time their glass was empty, they would get up and go and refill it. They only drank so much water. And so what the experimenters did instead is instead they put pitchers of water on the tables of the cadets and then they had people come, come by regularly and refill those pitchers with water regularly. So the cadets didn't really have to put any effort in getting up and getting the water. And this simple change, making the water more convenient to access, dramatically increased their water consumption. And this is the general idea around making modifications to your environment. 
So here is a list of ways that you can make modifications to your environment that will by default, generally subconsciously, enhance your well-being so that you can come across more strength, with more strength, more energy, and more vitality, which will dramatically enhance your executive presence. Surround yourself with plants. Get a mood lamp. Purchase a water purifier. Get an ergonomic chair. Purchase a sit-stand desk. Position your desk near sunlight. Invest in noise-canceling headphones. Another way of looking at your executive presence is to look at it as, in many respects, your personal brand, your reputation in live situations and online. Your personal brand tells the world who you are, what you stand for, and what you can do for them. In other words, it tells people in your world who you are. This is why it's so important to look at the cultivation of an executive presence of your executive presence in the same way you would look at cultivating your own personal brand, which focuses on the marketing of your most important product, you. Just like when we describe executive presence, your personal brand impacts how you walk, how you talk, how you carry yourself, and ultimately, how you come across as a professional and a leader. Here are seven examples of where having a strongly identified personal brand matters. How you answer the phone. How you conduct your meetings. How you conduct your presentations. Your social media profiles. Your desk or office. Your LinkedIn page. <laughs> your home and vehicle. How you interact with people below and above you. Here's a challenge for you to think about. How can you craft your own personal brand online? As we come to the conclusion of this course, it's now time to focus on how you can take the information that you've learned today, that I've shared with you today, and apply it to your professional life so that you can enhance, as I said in the beginning, your impact, your ability to persuade, as well as your reputation. To do this, we're going to start very small. What I want you to do is to go back to the three sections that we covered a little bit earlier, how you act, how you speak, and how you look, and then pick one tactic or one piece of information, one thing that you've learned from each of those sections, write it down in your workbook or on a piece of paper or post-it note, and say, this is one thing that I want to get better at it, and I plan to get better at. And then once you write it down on that piece of paper, I want you to put that piece of paper in your wallet, in your back pocket, or up on your wall, perhaps on a screensaver on your computer, and look at it each and every day so that you are constantly reminded of that behavior or that action or that strategy or tactic that you want to enhance that will ultimately lead to an enhanced level of executive presence for you. The key here is constant repetition and reminder of those strategies of those tactics that you've written down. This concludes the course, Elevate Your Impact. I truly hope you've understood the importance of developing this fundamental leadership trait, executive presence. And I also hope that you've learned one or two strategies that you can now take back to your place of work, to your professional life, apply it every day that will significantly enhance your ability to do your job, to perform your role as a leader.